Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. My name is Clay Lexon, and I'm an engineer with the City of Moorhead. This video is meant to serve as a source of information for a street construction project that is proposed to take place during the summer of 2023. This is a vicinity map of the project area and shows the rough limits of construction. This is a large area and can be generally described as the area between 1st Street South and River Drive South and between 6th Avenue South and 12th Avenue South. In this presentation, we'll go over a brief explanation of how the city selects its project areas how we decide which streets to do, and the different types of work we, could, we can do. I'll also explain the type of work we are proposing to do in your neighborhood. We'll also go over funding and special assessments, as well as some frequently asked questions. We'd also like this to be an opportunity for residents to provide some feedback, and I'll go over that later in the presentation. So you may be wondering how and why your street was chosen for improvements. There are several factors that are taken into consideration. One significant factor is what we call a pavement condition index, or PCI for short. And this allows us to create a value or a grade or a score as a representation of the condition of a certain road. The PCI is a numerical value with zero being the worst and 100 being the best. Zero would mean that there is no pavement left and 100 would mean essentially means brand new construction. Every roadway, every street within the city gets one of these values, and we update these values annually. The city hires a consultant to evaluate the condition of the road, and we take that information. We feed it into our pavement management software, and that helps us determine which projects to do based on our budget for the year. We also take into consideration additional factors, including the age of the street, how it was constructed, and whether any utility repairs are needed on the sanitary sewer or storm sewer, and whether our street work can be coordinated with other utility companies such as MPS and Excel. One of the ways we use our money the most efficiently is by performing major maintenance at critical points during the life of the street. Specifically, this happens when we're able to perform what's called a melon overlay. And I'll explain this type of project and several others on the next slide. On this slide, I will explain the three major types of projects that we typically perform. These are what we refer to as a melon overlay, a rehab, and a reconstruction. A melon overlay is the simplest of these three types of projects. During the mill and overlay, we remove the top couple inches of pavement using a milling machine, and then we put down a couple inches of new bituminous or asphalt pavement. During these projects, we are also required by law to update sidewalk and pedestrian ramps at intersections to make them ADA compliant. We will also replace certain sections of the curb and gutter if it isn't draining or if it's significantly damaged or broken up. We will also make repairs to the storm sewer inlets and manholes if it's needed. It's important to note that a mill and overlay project is the most cost-effective project we have. We get a, the most life out of our roads for the least amount of money. A mill and overlay will, on average, cost a little over $4 a square foot of roadway. The next type of project is what we call a rehab. This is where we will replace the entire pavement section, but we will leave the curb and gutter largely in place. We will do spot repairs on the curb and gutter and make the ADA updates and storm sewer improvements as well. This project is more involved than a mill and overlay and on average costs about $17 per square foot of roadway. A reconstruction is the third type of project and this is where we will completely replace the pavement and the curb and gutter. This is the most complex project type we will do and typically costs about $23 per square foot of roadway almost eight times what a mill and overlay will cost. Now that I've given a little bit of detail on the types of projects we do, I'm gonna explain when we typically like to do these types of projects and how it relates to the PCI. Over time and from use, the PCI of any given street will decrease. From time to time, we will perform maintenance on that street. And the type of maintenance depends on several factors, but is largely influenced by the PCI. The chart on this slide shows how our maintenance strategies change depending on the PCI value. 
Along the top, you can see the PCI values going from 100 to 0, from best to worst. And as you read from top to bottom, you can see that our different strategies and how they change as the PCI gets lower. For the early years of the pavement, we do minor maintenance such as crack sealing, seal coating, or chip seals. When the PCI drops into the 70s, we start looking at more significant maintenance, such as a mill and overlay, in order to bring that PCI value back up. If the PCI is even lower, and we don't think that a mill and overlay will be cost effective, we may look at more extensive projects, where we might replace the entire pavement section, call it rehab, or completely replace the pavement and curving gutter, which is called a reconstruction. Generally, the lower the PCI, the worst condition the road is in, and the more extensive and expensive the project is. On this slide is a graph that compares PCI versus time. The purpose of the graph is to show the value of maintenance, specifically of our mill and overlay projects. As I mentioned before, the mill and overlay type of project is the most cost-effective project type that we are able to do. If we are able to perform that type of project at critical points in the life of the road, we not only spend the least amount, but we can actually extend the life of the street by a number of years. The graph compares two scenarios, a street with no mill and overlay maintenance and a street with mill and overlay maintenance. The blue line is a street with no mill and overlay maintenance performed on it. It starts at a PCI value of 100 and over time decreases. Once it hits 30, we would reconstruct the road, and this cycle is shown twice. The orange line represents a road that does have mill and overlay maintenance performed on it. You can see a couple critical points on this graph. We would try to do a mill and overlay at those critical points, right around a PCI value of 60. When we perform that work, the road is repaired and the PCI is increased back to 100. And you can see that this cycle is repeated several times. Eventually, a mill and overlay won't be effective, and we would let the road decrease down to about 30, where we would then do a rehab or a reconstruction. Across the bottom of the graph are several blue and orange arrows that represent the life cycle of the road. These arrows are showing that a road with mill and overlay maintenance actually extend the life of the road, meaning that it's a longer period of time before we need to reconstruct it. Not only do we extend the life of the road, but based on the data that we have from past projects, we know that we will spend less money on maintaining our roads when we do it this way, and the condition of the road will also be maintained at a higher level. The average PCI of a road with no maintenance is 68, and the average PCI of a road with a mill and overlay maintenance is 73. That just means it's a nicer road and a smoother ride. So far, I've gone over a little information on the type of projects that we do and some of the reasoning behind how we determine which streets to do work on. And now I'm going to go over some project specific information about what we're proposing to do in your neighborhood. So most of the roads in this area were constructed in the 1950s. There really hasn't been any significant street construction projects since then. There have been some minor maintenance work that was performed on these street, including seal coats and the Public Works Street Department has likely completed similar work several times since then. There has also been some work on the roadways in the area in the early 2010s due to the flood mitigation projects, but no street improvement projects were made, just restorations to the street after the flood mitigation projects. It's also important to note that all the roadways in this area are gravel and oil streets, which means they require a rehab or a reconstruct. The only exception to this is Elm Street South from 6th to 7th Avenue South and 6th Avenue South, which are old bituminous overlaid concrete streets. And the reason these are being replaced is due to the MPS water main project. All of the ADA ramps in the project area are non-compliant, so those will be replaced. There are also some areas of sidewalk that will be replaced so that we can make them ADA compliant as well. But it's important to note that we will not be replacing all of the sidewalk within the project area. There are also many sections of curb and gutter that we will be replacing or attempting to correct to improve drainage on the street. The utilities, including the storm sewer and sanitary sewer, are in good condition. There are proposed improvements to be made to these items, which we will go over in the next slide. Additionally, a portion of the water main in this project is proposed to be replaced by MPS as a part of the project, which we will go over in more detail in the next slide as well. 
As seen on the map, the proposed improvements for this project include a rehabilitation for the entire project area. As a reminder, this is when we remove and replace the entire pavement section with spot curb and gutter and sidewalk replacement, as well as pedestrian ramp improvements. In addition to this, and shown in the green, it is proposed to extend the sanitary sewer main on Elm Street South between 11th and 12th Avenue South. The existing main does not meet the current design and development standards and is what triggered the need um, of an extension. Shown in the red is the proposed trunk storm sewer main installation on 11th Avenue South. There is an existing 12-inch storm sewer main already there. This will be removed and replaced with a 30-inch storm sewer main, and then it's going to be tied into the outfall to the river on the southwest corner of the project. This trunk storm sewer will line will provide better drainage capacity to the east central Moorhead area and lessen street flooding during large rainfall events. In the future, during other CIP projects, the trunk storm sewer line will be tied into and extended to the north of east to provide additional capacity to more neighborhoods. Shown as the blue line, Moorhead Public Service will be replacing their water main on 1st Street, Elm Street, and 7th Avenue. The city and Moorhead Public Service have collaborated and the city has included the water main replacement under its contract. Doing this allows the city and MPS to obtain the same contractor. This brings many benefits such as ease in construction, scheduling, consistency, and a less crowded project area. Lastly, and shown in yellow, Excel Energy will be replacing their gas main on 1st Street South. This project will be completed ahead of the city's project. On this slide, I've got some generic project information. The anticipated start date for this project would be sometime in May or June. I'm expecting that the contractor will want to get an early start, but it will be dependent on the contractor's schedule and it will be weather dependent as well. We will likely hold a pre-construction conference in April and at that meeting we'll get a schedule from the contractor and we'll know approximately when they want to start. At that time, the city will send out notifications to all the property owners along the project area and let you know when the approximate start date is as well. The final completion date for this project is September 30th. That doesn't necessarily mean that this entire project area will be in a state of construction from May to the end of September. It just means that the contractor has that window of time to complete the project. The project may be completed in phases as well and each phase would have a specific amount of time allotted for construction. In regard to resident access during construction, there will be times where residents will not have access to their driveways and will need to park vehicles on nearby streets that are not under construction. When this becomes necessary, you will be notified several days in advance that the road closure will happen. We will also have staff on site throughout the duration of the project that you can contact with questions. If you need any special considerations for access, please contact me as soon as possible and let me know so that we can do our best to accommodate you. For example, this may be a resident who makes use of a wheelchair or a resident who frequently makes use of the FM Ride Source program. If you would like, please feel free to speak to me about your situation and I'll do my best to accommodate you during construction. We will notify the police department that we have a construction project in the area, so they should not be ticketing if you're parked on a side street. If you do get a ticket, please contact me and we'll work to get it taken care of. Regarding garbage and recycling pickup, this will happen more or less like normal. If the trucks cannot get through to you to pick up your containers like they normally do, we'll ask that you bring your containers to the end of your driveway, and then the contractor will round them up, bring them to a common location for collection, and then they'll be returned to you. If that does become necessary, we ask that you put your name and house number somewhere on the container so it can be returned to you. As I mentioned previously, Moorhead Public Service and Excel both have projects in this area. It's likely that they are going to want to get an early start on their projects. I'm mentioning this again because it's going to be a very busy project area with a lot of work happening. I just want to clarify that if you see Moorhead Public Service or Excel, beginning their work, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're about to begin construction on the street as well. I do, however, want to make it clear that if Excel and Moorhead start their work, there may be areas in the road 
where they are excavating. So there might be sections of sidewalk that they remove as they reconnect services, and there may be sections of the curb and gutter that may get removed as well. Generally, when they do this, they maintain full access for residents, but it is something that I wanted to make you aware of. One construction item that we look at is whether there are any sidewalk gaps in the project area. Sometimes we do work in a neighborhood and there isn't continuous sidewalk or there might not be any sidewalk at all. Under city policy, we propose to fill in those gaps and install sidewalk where it's needed. When we do this, we mail out letters to the homeowners, letting them know that we are proposing to do this and then we survey them, asking them whether they want it or not. Generally, the letter is sent to everyone on the block where we are proposing to do the work. We understand that installing sidewalk where there historically has not been any can be controversial. So the city policy allows neighborhoods to opt out of the proposed sidewalk if 75% of the homeowners agree that they don't want it. If it's under 75%, then we install the sidewalk. As you can see on this slide, it is proposed to construct sidewalk, including three pedestrian ramps at the intersection of River Drive, Elm Street, and 9th Avenue South. We would be connecting to the existing sidewalk just to the south as shown. These improvements will provide connections to sidewalks in all directions and will also provide a connection to the Midtown Trail, which is proposed to be constructed on the levee, River Drive, and Elm Street during the summer of 2023. Letters were sent out in 2022 for this proposed work. 75% of the homeowners did not object, so this will be installed as a part of the street improvement project. In addition to this, and as you can see on the bottom part of this slide, it's proposed to install sidewalk on both sides of 9th Avenue South between Elm and 1st Street South. Per city policy, since no sidewalk is existing, it's proposed to install sidewalk on both sides of the street. We also had a homeowner request this work. Letters have not been sent out for this proposed infill, but homeowners will receive these in short order and be able to petition against the installation if opposed. Please make sure to reply to this letter so we get everyone's thoughts on this. When the city does projects like this, we typically get a lot of questions related to funding. So the next several slides will focus on that. We've estimated that the project will cost approximately $2.9 million. That includes all of the costs associated with construction as well as fees associated with financing the project. It also includes the deductions for the cost of MPS's water main replacement work. The funding on this project comes from two sources, special assessments and general obligation bonds. Special assessments on this project will come in just one type, the front footage assessment. Those assessments are expected to generate approximately $587,000, or roughly 20% of the cost of the project. The remaining $2,313,000, or, or roughly 80% of the project, will be funded through the general obligation bond that the city obtains on the open market. And these bonds are paid on through the, the city's general tax levy fund. Naturally, one of the questions that residents have after hearing about assessments is, well, how much am I going to be assessed for this project? So by city policy, special assessments will be levied at front footage rates approved by the Moorhead City Council for the type of work being done. Properties that front one of the streets in the project area will receive a special assessment based on several factors. The first being the type of work being performed on their street, and the second is based on the front footage of their property. For a rectangular lot, front footage is generally determined as the width of the lot abutting the street that is being improved. The rate depends on the type of work being done there. If the city is doing a mill and overlay, it's $35 a front foot. If it's a rehab, it's $75 a front foot. And for a reconstruction, it's $125 a front foot. Some projects also include an area-wide assessment, and this is a type of assessment that's generally included whenever there's work being done on a street that is classified as a collector street, which is a street that will see higher traffic volumes than any normal local street. Every property in the city is assigned a north-south collector street and an east-west collector street. The area-wide assessment rate is a flat $550 assessment for residential properties, and for commercial properties, it's a $550 per quarter acre of property. And I'll go through a couple examples a little bit later on that will explain this better. 
another question that we get commonly when we're doing st work on streets that intersect is, well, I live on a corner lot. Am I going to be assessed for work on both streets? And the answer is generally no. There is a 150 foot credit that is applied to all corner lots on the side street side of the lot. So if your lot is less than 150 feet deep, generally you're not going to receive an assessment for that work. On this slide, I want to run through a quick example of assessments and how they're calculated. So on the top, you have the three different rates. You have the mill and overlay rate at $35 a front foot, the rehab rate at $75 a front foot, and the reconstruction rate at $125 a front foot. So the example goes like this. Consider a resident who owns a property that is 60 feet wide that is adjacent to one of the following project types. So for a mill and overlay, it's $35 a front foot times 60 feet wide is $2,100. Dollars a rehab rate seventy five dollars a front foot times sixty feet wide is forty five hundred dollars a reconstruction rate which is one hundred and twenty five dollars a front foot times sixty five or sixty feet wide is seventy five hundred dollars. It's also important to note that if there is a collector street within the project area that's being worked on, that there is also an area-wide assessment that would be added to the mill and overlay rate or the rehab rate or the reconstruction rate. So if there's that $550 area-wide assessment could be added to any one of these rates if the streets being worked on are a collector street. On the previous slide, I went through an example for determining assessments. Typically, those assessments would be added to the property taxes in January of the following year after the project. So it's 2023, and we're proposing to do this project. In the fall of 2023, you'll receive a notice from the city letting you know what the assessments would be. And then in January 2024, the amount would be officially added to your property taxes. So typically, those assessments would be paid for over a period of 20 years. The city uses a constant principal method for determining an assessment, and that's shown in the table on the right-hand side. Property owners should know that if they want, they will have the opportunity to pay part or all of the assessment before it's officially added to the property taxes. This allows the property owner to pay less interest or no interest if they were to choose to pay it all off. The table on the right hand shows year one through year 20 and shows the starting assessment amount, the principal, the interest, and the total annual payment. In this example, it's an assessment amount of $5,000. You can see the principal amount stays the same from year one to year 20, but that the interest amount decreases each year so that the total annual payment as a part of the property taxes would also decrease it as well. In this example, the annual amount for year one is $475 a year, or about $40 a month. And in year 20, it would be about half of that at $261, or about $22 a month. This is one of the last slides of the presentation. We like to provide opportunities for residents to provide feedback or ask questions. So please feel free to reach out by phone or send me an email with any questions or suggestions you might have. Also, this is a really good time to talk to us if you have to make repairs to your existing sanitary service. There are ways that the cost of replacing the service on your property can be assessed to your property. If you're interested in doing that, there are restrictions to it, of course, and it requires some paperwork. But if you'd like more details, please reach out to us. Lastly, please let us know if you have sump pump lines or an irrigation line in the boulevard next to the street. Often we only find out about these after we've dug them up, and if you have one, we can mark it and do our best to try to avoid it. If you are interested in receiving periodic email updates about the project prior to construction and then during construction, there is a way to do that. If you go to the city's website and click on the e-notifications tab on the top, there is a spot where you can fill in some contact information and then select your project. Submit that info and then you'll get put on a list. When we do send out updates, you'll receive that email. 
This is the last slide for this presentation. There's contact information for myself on the slide, as well as Amy Weagle, our Special Assessments Coordinator. If you have questions specifically related to Special Assessments, please feel free to reach out to Amy. If you have questions about rates or amounts or how the whole process works, she is the one that you're going to want to speak with. And if you made it this far in this presentation, I just want to thank you for sticking with me. Thank you again for your time. And again, please feel free to reach out to us with any questions.